I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Hymn number 534 is what we'll start after prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings in our lives and for the opportunity to come here at this midweek service to continue to study your word and also to thank you and to praise you for all that you do. Bless us now as we spend this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So hymn number 534 is Will Your Anchor Hold? Will Your Anchor Hold? Hymn 534. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor hold or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the souls steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. If tis safely moored, twill the storm will stand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables passed from his heart to thine can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It will firmly hold in the straits of fear when the breakers tell that the reef is near. Though the tempest rave and the wild winds blow, not an angry wave shall our bark o'erflow. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It will surely hold in the floods of death. When the waters cold chill our latest breath. On the rising tide it can never fail. While our hopes abide within the veil, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Final stanza. When our eyes behold in the dawning light, shining gates of pearl our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast to the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Amen. Elder Yorte is going to come now and lead us through our prayer time. Thank you.
Good evening, good evening, good evening, saints. It is good to be here during this midweek to recharge our batteries because we know that we've been going and going and going, but this is the best time to come and present ourselves before the Lord. We do realize that our God is able. As I stand here, I know that there are quite a bit of people who are really disturbed by things that are going on in your life right now. We want to bring before you, uh, just before we pray, mention some names. Um, Bobby, little Bobby, we've been praying for little Bobby. That is the grandson of our dear sister, Melva Clark. As I speak now, Bobby is in coma. We want to pray that the Lord will touch him in a very special way. Also, there is a mother who is on a ventilator, has been struck with this virus, a coronavirus, and she's been on a ventilator for almost two weeks now. The doctors are giving us some good hope, but as human beings, our hearts are troubled. The children, as well as the grandchildren, their hearts are troubled. But we believe that our God is able. In whatever situation we find ourselves, he is able to come through for us. And so at this time, I will like to invite you I, if you have any prayer request, just put it in the chart or just mention it to the Lord as I pray. And the Lord who does all things well, the one who can hear the sinner's cry, will hear your prayers as well and come through. So I invite you to bow your heads with me at this time as we pray. Eternal Father in heaven, we come before you to praise your holy name, to lift you up, and to glorify you. For indeed, you are a good God. We know, Lord, that with you all things are possible. As well as this hour, Lord, I pray for forgiveness of my sins and cleansing from all unrighteousness. Uh, Father, as I lift up this prayer tonight, that you clear the airways and not allow anything to block our prayers from coming to you. In a very special way, Lord, I bring little Bobby to you tonight. Oh, Father in heaven, it's almost a year that this boy has been struggling to survive. And now he is in coma. We don't know, Father, what your plans are for him. But you know it too well, even before he was born. And so we pray in a very special way, Lord, that you will touch him like you've never touched him before. We ask you, Lord, to surround him with your angels and make a fence around him. We pray, Lord, that as the doctors are attending to him, Father, that you will instruct them as to what to do. Father, this alone is enough to, to weaken the faith of his parents. Nigel and, um, and Tiffany, I am begging you, Lord, and bringing them before you, that, Father, as they see their child in this situation, that they will, their faith will not weaken, but rather to continue to hold on to your own changing hands and to realize that you, the God, who created Bobby is also able to do what human beings see as impossible. So I pray, Father, that you be with the rest of the family members, Melva Clark also, who loves you so dearly, and always calling upon your holy name. And then, Father, I bring before you Doreen Mars, who is in the hospital, who has been struck down with COVID-19. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will touch her and breathe through her nostrils, Lord, a new fresh breath of life. 
You are the only one who can breathe into anything, Father, and that thing can become a living soul. And so I pray, Father, that you will touch her. Oh, Lord, the hands that you've employed while you were here on earth, you touched so many lives and they were made whole. Touch Doreen Mars in a very special way. Loving Father, you said your ears are not too heavy that you cannot hear. So may you, O oh Lord, bow down your ear, Father, and hear our prayers tonight. You said when she is in the deep waters, Lord, you will be with her. When she's going through the fire, you will not forsake her, but you will be with her. In fact, Father, you said you do not slumber nor sleep. And so we bring all our members who are going through some serious crisis right now. No matter what the crisis are, Lord, may you, Father, remember each person tonight in a very special way. You are, you are Jehovah Jireh, the provider. And so I pray, O oh Lord, that whatever we need, whatever our members need, that you will supply it. Whether it be health, O oh Lord, touch them and heal because you are the greatest physician. You are the greatest healer of all times. We do remember this lady who had an issue of blood for 12 years. All she had to do was just touch the hem of your garment and let you float from you to her. May you, O oh Lord, allow let you to flow from you tonight and touch those who need healing tonight. Whether it be mental healing, Lord, I pray. Whether it be coronavirus, I pray, Lord. Whether whatever the situation will, it is, Lord, may vet you flow from you tonight, Father, that people will be healed, and not just healed, but be restored fully. And then I bring before you those who are facing financial crisis. You own everything in this world, Lord. May you, Father, open up the windows of heaven and pour your blessings upon them. How, O oh Lord, can your children be going from day to day with their heads down in sadness and living in despondency? Whereas we serve a God like you, Lord, may you, Father, open your arms and bless your children tonight. I am pleading, Lord, those who are going through some social issues tonight, have mercy upon them. Be with each family member of Ephesus, Lord. May you be the glue and the, be the center of our homes. Attach yourself to us, O oh Lord. And Father, we are begging you to continue to bless us as your children. I bring before you our pastor tonight, Pastor Goodman, who you call to lead this congregation, Lord. You know the sorrow that went through their household as well. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will continue to strengthen him and strengthen the rest of the family members, O oh Lord. I pray, Father, that you continue to bless the Fordham as well as the right families in a very special way. And as he stands before you tonight to bring the message, Lord, may you speak through him for the edification of the saints. We will be careful to give you all the praise and the honor. We cannot wait for you to come down, Lord, and take us home, where we'll live with you throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Until then, Lord, do not separate us from yourself. Father, as you've inscribed our names in your palm, the palm of your hands, so continue to watch over us. May you, may we continue to be apples of your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen. I want to thank Elder Yorte for taking us to the throne of grace. Uh, tonight, if you will, turn in your Bibles 
We continue our study of the book of Hebrews with Hebrews chapter 8. I'm not sure if I'll get past verse 5 tonight or whether or not I'll go all the way down to verse 13, but if you would, please go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. We'll begin there. We'll see where the time takes us. With Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read it to you in two, two, two translations. The first one will be the King James Version, and the second will be the New Living Translation. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now, if you've got time, you can hit the share button. There might be somebody who needs to hear this message tonight that's in your circle of influence, that's in your friends. So if you don't mind, hit the share button, share it on your line. If I don't speak the truth, you can erase it afterward, but go ahead and share it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, New Living Translation. Here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest, capital H, capital P, must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle. God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. For just a few minutes tonight, I want to teach on the message. There's nothing like the real thing, baby. You've heard that phrase before. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Father, Lord, we want to hear from you. You be our teacher as you promised in this very chapter uh, through your Holy Spirit. That new covenant promise, we ask that you will be our teacher and our guide tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. That's, that's a phrase from a song, and it's been adopted by many companies who have used it in their commercials. But tonight, we have bumped into, in this eighth chapter, a shift. Uh, things that he has mentioned or hinted at previously, now he comes right out and says. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he hinted, at what he's talking about explicitly now in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. In chapter 6, he says, verses 19 to 20, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, hmm? both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us, entered even Jesus, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's saying he entered into the veil. That's a reference that every Hebrew who had become a Christian would understand. Remember, the book of Hebrews is written to those who were first followers of Judaism, but who have now accepted Christ, but they're struggling. Times are hard, and their faith is a little shaky. But he's making a reference that each one of them would understand that only the priest could enter beyond the veil. He's hinting in chapter 6. 
And then in chapter 7, in verse 26, he says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And now he says, and made higher than the heavens. He's a different kind of high priest. But he's in the real place. He's not in that tabernacle in the wilderness. He's not in that tent that those Gershonites and Kohathites and, and the others would break down and move from place to place. Now, in chapter 8, he tells us that we have a high priest. And he's in the real sanctuary that's in heaven. You know, I've told you many times and I'll remind you that they were in a shaky place as believers. And he's letting them know that your assurance, that the Christian's assurance is more than a feeling. It's more than just hope. What he's saying to us is that it's, it's, it's rested on eternal realities. I used to have a professor uh, named Dr. Sylvia Barnes at Oakwood University, and she would say, Jesus is the only reality. She said, Jesus is the only reality that all of the things that we experience down here, they're not real compared to him. Because the truth is that all of this stuff is going to go away. Yeah. Peter says that all of it's going to mount, melt with fervent heat. All of it will go away. I mean, all of the skyscrapers right now, uh, we celebrated yesterday an the passing of an infrastructure bill, uh, a bipartisan legislation that's happened in America, something that we haven't seen happen too often of, re of late, but, but it has happened where Democrats and Republicans have come together to say, hey, let's work together to be able to rebuild our bridges and to, to pave our roads and to make sure that, that we have safe transportation from one part of the country to the next. But all of that, every skyscraper, <laughs> the Interstate Highway Act that, that Dwight Eisenhower was instrumental in, in setting forth, all of that is going to go away. But, but what will remain is Jesus. He is the only reality. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that our faith rests on something that is more sure than anything you have ever seen or will ever see in this life. Our faith, our assurance rests on eternal realities that are not in any Levitical priesthood, not in any tabernacle in the wilderness, but there's a real throne room a real sanctuary that's in heaven. So that when all of this melts away, guess what? That will still be in place. And the one who is in that throne room will still be in place. And so the, the encouragement is to keep your faith firmly fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If you're with me, give me a thumbs up. All right. So now, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8 is what the writer of Hebrews is really pointing back to. That when the children of Israel had come out of more than 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God uses Moses to lead them out. And as they are being led out and they finally get to a place, God meets them at a mountain. And he says something to them in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Now, I'm not preaching, but I want you to understand this is, this is, a, uh, this is something that God is initiating. So, so stay with me now. While I'm talking about sanctuary, and the center of the sanctuary is law and all that stuff. Please understand who is initiating. I want you to, to be sure. I want you to have assurance based upon what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us. He is basing what he's saying to them on something that was said to them in Exodus 25. When they meet God at that mountain, he says in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, listen to this. And let them make me a sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary. All right? If, so, if I ask somebody to make me something, make me a suit, huh? It's for me. Right? That suit if I say, make me a suit, I want you to measure me. I'm not going to tell you my measurements, but I'm going to tell you, uh, measure the chest and measure my arm length. And, and I want it to fit me. It's for me. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that, this is God talking, 
I may dwell among them. This, this should blow your mind. That the great God of the universe says to this ex-band of enslaved people that I think so much of you, not only that I will deliver you, but I'm not just taking you out and I'm going to leave you to fend for yourselves to figure it out. He says, I have brought you out like a damsel in distress. You didn't do anything. You didn't. You don't earn anything. But I loved you enough to not only rescue you, but I want to let you know that I want to stay with you. I want to dwell with you. I want to build my home with you. Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then he says, now make my house according to all that I show you. Don't, don't build for me what you want. Don't, don't build according to the dictates of your conscience or your opinion. I need you to make something for me, but make it the way that I want it. Hmm? All right. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments, therefore, even so shall you make it. So he's saying, make me a dwelling place according to what I show you, because it is a pattern. There's a pattern of a true tabernacle that I want you to try to imitate. Now, I know it's not going to look like much as a little child who draws her parents, doesn't look exactly like the parents, right? And so what Moses, even at his best, and all those who would construct that earthly tabernacle, the best they were able to do was only a shadow of what was in heaven. But God said, I need you to make it because I'm going to act something out for the next couple of hundred to the next few thousand years to help you understand what I'm really trying to accomplish for you. I love you. I've rescued you. And now I want to dwell among you. And I want, as I dwell among you, to point you to eternal realities. Uh huh. Uh huh. So Exodus 25, verse 8. And in Hebrews 8, we already talked about it. In verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. The real thing, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, this should give us a level of humility. I knew one preacher who had studied the sanctuary so closely that he had come up with the four food groups that you find in the sanctuary. That's not true. You don't find the four food groups in the sanctuary. And, and I, I want to encourage you to understand that in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, it talks about a parable. And everybody knows that when you study a parable, you can't take every little detail of the parable. Jesus told parables to help convey a big point. Because if you believe everything in a parable, you would, you would talk about the story of the rich man and Dives. The name Dives isn't even found in the scripture. But this man, he was rich and didn't think anything of the poor. And then he's lying in Abraham's bosom. Have mercy. Abraham's bosom right? That, that, that doesn't make sense. That wouldn't make any sense because it's a parable. It's, you don't take every literal thing. And so when we look at the sanctuary, some people think they can tell you exactly how many bricks are in the heavenly sanctuary. None of that, none of that, none of that, none of that, none of that. No, he's helping us to get a major point. It's an illustration of what God is doing to effect our salvation. And it happens in the real place up there. And down here, what we had was only an illustration of what God was trying to do. God's real throne is in heaven. But catch this. His throne is not like earthly thrones in a palace. His throne is in the sanctuary. What? You mean to tell me that the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but this is why that Old Testament uh, king and priest thing was happening is because our king dwells in a sanctuary. Now, what's the significance of a sanctuary? Come on, go back to what the old one that was only an illustration was trying to teach us. That sin is dealt with in the sanctuary. That's what happens, that we make mistakes and we acknowledge that we make mistakes. And so that the soul that sinneth shall die, well, so that each sinner didn't die, they had to then take a sinless, innocent lamb and transfer their sins onto the head of the lamb to help us see that somebody's got to pay the price when I mess up. But it was only an illustration. 
The reason why they had to do it over and over again, as he'll tell us in this chapter, is because it didn't really cure the sin problem. It was only pointing forward to the one who would. And in John chapter 1 and verse 29, when John sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He fixed the sin problem. So the throne is the sanctuary in heaven. In Psalm chapter 110 and verse 4, we've talked about this many times, but I hope that you're going to get it. Repetition deepens the impression. Dean Ruth Mosby Green used to tell me at Pine Forge Academy, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We already talked about the fact that the Levitical priesthood was not uh, as, uh, it, it was inferior to the priesthood of Melchizedek, which came before Le Levitical priesthood that was in the loins of Abraham. And Abraham, he worshiped and paid tithes to Melchizedek as an illustration that there is another priesthood, but not only another priesthood that's legitimate, but that this one is superior to the Levitical priesthood. So one Psalm chapter 11 and verse four says, the Lord is in his holy temple. We used to sing that uh, when I grew up in a little church down in slower, lower Delaware. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in heaven. Did you catch that? He says the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. And then Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? So what I want you to get is that all of that Old Testament stuff and what he's trying to tell to these Hebrews who are shaky in their faith and thinking about going back to that which they were more comfortable with, that looked better, that flowed better. He says that was only a shadow. The Levitical ministry was a shadow that pointed forward to the work of Christ. Christ has come. It was not successful in curing the sin problem. That wasn't its real function. It was always an illustration. Now, let's think about this. Uh, when I went to preach in Africa, I've had the opportunity to preach there a couple of times. But one time I went to Africa and I preached a meeting in Botswana. Botswana, Africa. And I went over first, right? And, and Evelyn, because she was working, she couldn't take off the whole time that I was doing the pre-work in the meeting. But she came to join me at a certain point. So this is before uh, high-speed internet. We did have little, whatever that stuff was that King, uh, AOL had, something where you could kind of see each other, but it wasn't that good, you know? But we went over there, and so I would see her on this slow internet, I would, and it would, it would jerk, you know, and it was pixely, but I would see my wife, you know? talk to her at one point every night for a little while. That, that was a picture, right? Now imagine this, that when my wife finally came over to Botswana, that I'm still logging on to AOL and trying to see a pixelated picture of her when I've got the real thing in my hotel room with me. You follow what I'm saying? There, there ain't nothing like the real thing. I mean, it was good to talk to Evelyn, uh, using the, the medium of technology to be able to find out what was going on with the boys. The, my daughter was not yet born. It was, that was all fine and dandy. But when she came, I'm closing the computer because I've got my wife in the room with me. What he's saying is that when you all keep going back to the old stuff, and I want to talk to you tonight to understand that some of us, we are not the Hebrews, but there's some stuff that worked for us. Huh? Some of you were really Christians before you became a part of our denomination. That's real. However, God taught you something else. Something about how you ought to care for your body temple. Something about how you do not own all 100% of the money that they give you in your check. Taught you something about what you ought to drink and not drink. Taught you something about how you ought to reserve 24 hours every seven days for him and to not work. He taught you something. That does not mean that what, what, what you had in the past had no value in it whatsoever. Nope, nope, nope. We are not suggesting that the old covenant was wrong because the old covenant was given by God. It just was incomplete. 
The opening words of Hebrews say that God has spoken to us in times past, but now he's spoken to us through his son. In the past, he spoke to us through black and white, but now he's spoken to us in living color. What I'm saying to you is that, that what was in the past was good for what it was good for in the past. But now that Jesus has come, we're not going to look at the old pixelated picture. Now we've got the real thing. We've got a high priest, a minister of a better covenant with better promises. Whoever lives to make intercession for us right now. And even though things might get difficult, we ought not turn back to that which we had in the past because God has brought us to a new place, a richer place, and a richer understanding of what he's doing for us right now. If you're with me, give me a thumbs up. So it's a parable. It's a parable. What we find in the Old Testament. The true offering now has been made. Jesus Christ, who gave up his life on that good Friday. A true priest is now in place. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And so he's saying, let's change our focus. The scene of action has changed from that tabernacle in the wilderness now to the true sanctuary that's found in heaven. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 encourages us. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He is acknowledging times are hard. Times get difficult. Things that we do not understand happen. But Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Not only that, he was in all points tempted like as we are. He can identify with our struggles yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Ah, listen to me. I don't know what you've been going through. Our family has gone through some things lately. But God says, don't run from me. Come boldly to me. If you've got somebody who's sick or on life support or in a hospital right now, don't run from him uh, questioning, saying, God, I don't know why. If you're a good God, you would let this happen. No, come boldly to the throne of grace. He may not give you what you ask for, the way you want it, when you want it, but always remember that God is on another throne. His ways are past finding out. He sits on the circle of the earth and he can see stuff that you can't see. He can see what's happening in my house right now and on the other side of the globe in a different time zone and on a different day. He can see everything at once, but not only that, he can see back into the past and he can see forward into the future. God knows what he's doing. When we do not understand him, he says, still come to me. Come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need. I want to encourage you. We have someone that we have direct access to right now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God in the true tabernacle in heaven. You should be encouraged even when you don't understand what's going on because you've got access to someone who has all power and he is there right now. You don't have to go to anybody's confessional booth. You don't have to try to find your way or fight your way through traffic to get behind some confessional to another man who's just like you with weaknesses just like you to try to get a connection. No, you may right now in your own home if you can't reach the pastor, if you can't reach your parish elder, if you can't reach your grandmother who knows how to get prayer through, you can talk to him right now. Because right now in the throne room of heaven is someone who can hear you and who can answer every single one of your prayer requests. If you're with me, give me a thumbs up. All right. So we got a better covenant. Hmm? It's a better covenant, not because God made a mistake, but because we have a high priest who is in the true tabernacle. It's a better covenant because it's got all these promises that God has made. Not that we make. A covenant is an agreement, right? I'm going to end with this. A covenant is an agreement. And so you have a, a covenant that's made when you get a new job. And, and you say, I will do this and that for this amount of money. 
covenant between you and your employer. A covenant is what happens between a husband and a wife. I told you all a few weeks ago when Paul talks about the relationship of the husband and the wife. Before we get to verse 22 where it says wives submit yourselves to the hus your husbands. It says before that submitting to one another. There is equality. There is difference in function. But there's equality. The man and the woman were created for each other in a complementary way. There's equality. So when covenant is spoken of, most of the time, it is syntheke, that covenant between equals. But you know something? When Hebrews talks about covenant, he uses a different word. He uses the word diatheke. Sounds similar, but it's a little different. And what he's doing here is he's helping us to understand this is a better covenant. The word diatheke is not simply an agreement. This one is, it is an agreement, but it's similar to a last will and testament. <laughs> a last will and testament. I was with my parents the other day at the funeral of Uncle Butch, and uh, we were just after the repast, standing in the parking lot, and I'm talking to them, and I'm teasing my dad. I said, now, do you have your will made out, you know? I said, you know, you can leave everything to me. Now, I'm joking because I've got an older brother who by rights, biblically, would have twice as much as me, another older brother and an older sister, so I'm teasing with them. But I said, you know, you, you need to make sure that you got your affairs in order. That last will and testament, listen to this, is made out, it is an agreement, but it is made out by the testator, the testator. He's the one who writes out who gets what. It's his will. It's binding. But the people who receive have nothing to do with it. It's his will to write them into his will and to give them what he wants. He says, this is not a syntheke between two equals. No, this is a diatheke, which means that God is the one who initiates the fact that you're going to get something. It's all of his stuff that he has put together to give to you. All of his grace, all of his mercy, all of his blessings, all of his eternity, all of his forgiveness, all of that, he says, I'm giving it to you. I'm entering into a relationship the same way that a testator says, these are my children, therefore I want them to get something, but they don't have anything to do with getting it except to comply with what I've said in my will. And so it's a better covenant because it's not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon him. And what I have is based on who he is and the richness and the fullness of his grace. And so I, it's a better covenant than the one in the past, which, you know, we declare that we're going to do everything you tell us to do, but we don't have the power to do it. So that illustrates the need to do it over and over again. That Levitical priesthood that lasted only as long as the priest would live was only as good as until the next time you needed to do it again. But Jesus comes across as a better sacrifice. He dies one time for everybody who ever lived, for everybody who will ever live, for every sin that I have committed and every sin that I will commit. That does not mean that I should be flipping with it, but he's died one time for all of that. What I've got to do is comply. First John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, guess what? There's enough money in the count. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, I can't access that if I don't accept him. I can't access that if I will not confess it and repent. I can't access it. But everything that I need for life and godliness is already given to me in the testator. It's a better covenant with better promises by a better hype. It's just better. So I want to tell you all tonight as I close up that I want to encourage you to stay with Jesus. These are troubling times. 
They are difficult times. We are facing some stuff that we've never faced before. Even as a pastor, I feel like I'm pastoring for the first time ever. And that doesn't mean that these are not lovely people right around me, but things have changed. Pastoring in a pandemic, post-pandemic, still in a Delta variant pandemic is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weary. But, but guess what? Jesus is still on the throne. And Jesus is still omniscient. And Jesus has still established his church, Acts of the Apostles, page 9, as God's appointed agency for the saving of men, salvation of men. So what I'm here to say to you is that even though it's difficult and it's challenging, both personally and professionally, I will not turn away from the one who ever lives to make intercession. The one who says, come on, Keith, the stuff that you've tried in the past won't work. But guess what? I can still work. And I want to encourage you as you go through these difficult times to keep your hand in the hands of the master. Keep on trusting in him. Don't let your dis the, the, the difficulties discourage you. You've made some mistakes. That's, all, that, that's behind you. Jesus covers that if you will confess it to him. But come boldly to him. That's what he says. Come on. Because the real one is sitting on this throne in heaven. That old tabernacle... Don't, don't put your trust in the stuff in the past. Put your trust in the one who ever liveth to make intercession for us. Ain't nothing like the real one, baby. Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. And we hear you speaking to the Hebrews who were in a time of persecution, who were in a time of being misunderstood, ostracized. You were speaking to them but your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The fact that it's living means that we hear the Spirit speaking to us today to say, don't turn back. Don't let go. Don't lose your faith. And as we sang earlier, may our anchor hold. Help us to hold on until faith becomes sight. Help us to hold on. Lord, we thank you so much that we have a risen savior and a high priest who is in the true tabernacle, not made by man, but made by our loving heavenly father. We thank you that you intercede right now for us and help us rather than turning to other human beings in our times of confusion to fall on our knees and to talk to our great high priest who is always available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and 366 on a leap year. You are always ready to hear from your children and you desire to guide us, to give us wisdom as to which way we should go. I thank you for your love for us. We're not worthy of it, but we thank you that as the testator, you've put things in place Help us to comply that we may receive all of the blessings that you have for us both now and in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a message, what a message, what a message. Just want to thank the Lord for the message that he brought to us through Pastor Goodman. You know, you and I have to be thankful to Jesus Christ every single moment. What can we do without him? And so I just want you to open your hymn books. Let's just close with 246. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise Him. Hallelujah. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. I tell you, I, I don't know how I can survive anything without Jesus Christ, our high priest. Thank God that he did not remain in the grave, but he ascended 
and he is in the sanctuary pleading your case and pleading my case. And so I want you all to join in with me tonight as we just sing this song to praise his holy name. Right? Everyone. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. God was slain. Glory, alleluia. Praise Him, alleluia. Come on, join me. Glory, hallelujah. Praise him, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Thus may we each moment feel. Everyone, thus may we moment feel. Love him, serve him, praise him still. Till we all on Zion's hill see the Lamb. Everyone of the chorus coming now. Glory, hallelujah. Praise Him, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. To Let us pray. Oh, loving Father, we love you. We thank you, Father, for coming to die for us. We thank you, Father, that you ascended to heaven to be in the sanctuary, to serve as our advocate. I thank you for the message that we heard tonight through your man's servant. May we all, O oh Lord, tap into your power. We are your children. Help us to continue to trust you and to continue to have the faith in you and not to allow anything to snatch you away from us. So we thank you, Lord. Bless our church members. Those who are going through problems, Lord, be merciful unto them. Again, thank you so much for your men servants who brought this message to us. And as we continue to praise your holy name throughout the night. May you see all of us through and bring us back on Sabbath to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and be well. Continue to trust and have faith in God. Amen.